Hey everyone, uh, happy Tuesday. Uh, welcome back to another Movie Mates video. I'm Matthew, here with my wonderful co-host and best friend. Callum. Callum. Uh, so yes, as is you can see... Bit... What is it, sorry? You, you wish them a happy Tuesday. Will this be going up on a Tuesday? Yeah, well, it's, it's, today is Tuesday, isn't it? Yeah. It is, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll hopefully get it up tonight. If not, I'll, I'll edit that bit out. <laughs> There. But um, yeah, as you as you guys can see by the title, it's um, it's our first, it's our, well, it's our second two parter uh, podcast, and it's Scooby Doo films. So it is. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna uh, let Callum explain basically what what movies we're gonna be talking about, and um, yeah, just general talking points really. So Callum, what, what explain to the get viewers what we're gonna be talking about today? Well, in special honor of the soon to be soon to be released uh, animated reboot Scoob, uh, which is releasing on May 15th on Video On Demand uh, due to the coronavirus stopping its uh, theatre release. Uh, we're going to be talking about Scooby-Doo's live action forays into film uh, over the next week. So today we're kicking off with part one and we're going to talk about uh, the OG, the, the original two, uh, Scooby-Doo and Scooby-Doo 2 Monsters Unleashed. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. And I'm I didn't talk about these because these were a huge part of my childhood. I don't know about you. Uh, these are the first. This is the first time I've actually seen these two films. But um, I guess what? that's what. Yeah, really. Yeah, first time. First time. See, that's the thing I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, like, do you have much nostalgia for like the Scooby Doo franchise in general? Uh, like, especially these movies, or were you not really a big oh, Scooby Doo fan? Um, like I've I've been watching Scooby Doo probably since the age of three. Wow. Uh, but it, it's it's probably been. I mean, it was there before superheroes, and you know how big superheroes were in my childhood. Yeah, absolutely. So it's it's been massive. You know, I've seen well, I've seen every Scooby Doo film, of which I think there's like thirty five or so. Uh, wow. Big, up until up until about twenty sixteen, where the quality really started to dip, and they started like writing it for like younger and younger generations. Mm -hmm. And you know, I I always enjoyed the the live action films, the animated films, and then obviously. The the animated TV series. Like I, I don't know which ones you watch, but I, I used to watch uh, What's New Scooby Doo, Scooby Doo Where Are You, Scooby Doo Mystery Incorporated, A Pup Named Scooby Doo. Uh, I think that I think that that's probably the extent of it. But I like I don't know how they have milked so many movies and TV shows out of like an original character. Like there's no original basis for it. You know, it's not based on source material or, source material or anything. Yeah, like it's really interesting to see like how this franchise has lasted i think it was like what was it 60s or 70s it started maybe before that yeah and uh, like the first uh it was uh, the first was scooby-doo where are you which started in 1969 there you go like that's that's crazy like 50, over 50 years and you know for that amount of time it's maybe at the time it was like an original com concept but like even now like every plot of, of every episode's essentially the same you know Four teens and a dog solving a mystery, you know, and unmasking the the villain at the end. So, I, I, you know, I'm a massive fan of the franchise. Like you said, uh, what's new Scooby Doo? I loved uh, in the primary school days, and then obviously Mystery Incorporated uh, as well. Like that that show, we can just do an episode on that show, like in the future, because that 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 show was generally like really really fantastic writing for a kids show. There were so many different subplots in there, and uh, no, like I'm a big fan and. Uh, I'm just, it was really interesting to watch these two live action movies because this is the first live action adaptation of Scooby Doo I, I was, I've ever seen. So um, I'm, I'm really, in, in, uh, really excited to hear. Wait, have, you, have, you not seen, have you not seen The Mystery Begins either? Nope. <laughs> what, what have you been doing with your life? Yeah, I don't, I don't know, honestly. Like, I'm so glad I did watch these because, like, I think they're they're definitely films, and the Scooby Doo franchise is definitely a franchise that a lot of a lot of you know two thousands kids uh, can say like molded their childhood uh, on because you know Scooby Doo was on TV all the time when we were growing up. So um, no, I'm I'm glad I'm glad these films sort of have a cult following about them, and uh, we get to talk about them today for sure. Yeah. So did you want to just kick off with Scooby Doo two thousand and two? We can launch right in. Yeah. Uh, just that. Just to add a little bit of context, uh, I want to talk about sort of the original concept of the film in okay. that I, I assume that it always had quite a similar plot to what we saw, but it was in 
originally envisioned as sort of more like a teen sex comedy. I, uh, I can imagine that. <laughs> it was, it was, it was going to be, in America, it would have been a PG-13. So here that could have either been a 12 or a 15, but really it was going to be directed towards teenagers. Uh, obviously this film's written by James Gunn and he's known for more like risque jokes, you know. Yeah, and, raunchy type humor, I guess. Yeah, because I mean, even in Guardians of the Galaxy, which is sort of Gunn being toned down, there, there's still quite a lot of sex comedy, uh, yeah. which is obviously reined in reined in a bit for this film, but you can clearly see the undertones and sort of the, the jokes written for adults that remain in there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but they, had, they, they had to spend a huge amount of the budget, like CGI over, like CGIing uh, cleavage. Yeah, I had, I had that in my notes as well. Like, that was crazy. <laughs> that was crazy. Like, how far are we going to push the boat on that? Yeah, it's... I, 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 I don't know, like, I guess just in most scenes, like, I assume it was mostly to do with Velma, uh, because obviously she's wearing a, you know, she's wearing a turtleneck for the entire film. I, yeah. you know, I, I presume there were, there were scenes where there, there was more skin showing and they had to dial it back if they wanted to remain kid friendly. Like, do you think it's a curious choice to, like, sort of sexualize this f- franchise like uh, the scooby-doo Scooby- movie like tv shows were never i don't think they were ever known to be utterly like risque or anything so like do you think it do you think it works well it's it's really weird uh i have i have it in my notes about yeah so like the, the this whole movie sort of feels like a parody of the scooby you know yeah. it's it's sort of like it's making fun of it and it's like them moving on and being like depressed adults and yeah. then you know they return to the mystery solving so like it seems really weird to do that for the first ever live action iteration, you know, because yeah. like it's it seems more like you would you know do like the definitive version of the Scooby Gang, and then retroactively say, and this is what would happen to them if they broke up. Like that wouldn't be like what I would decide the first ever film of theirs to be. That's a thing, dude. Like. I don't know if you get this as well, but it almost feels like the two films are the wrong way around. Like, I think two would almost have worked better as the first film rather than the first film, you know, they, they split up and then get back together. You know, I, I, I thought that was a curious decision to make because I, for me, I don't know if you found this, I, I'm, and we'll mention the second film in detail later on, but I think the second film, Monsters Unleashed, feels more inherently like a Scooby-Doo story than the first one does. And there are many yeah. reasons why for that. But um, no, I, th- I think you're 100% on the right lines there. Like, it was a really cur- curious decision to make. Uh, and especially, like, for the, f- as you said, like, the first iteration in the franchise. But uh, it must have done well in the box office to warrant a sequel, at least, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I suppose. Uh, did you want to talk about, then, uh, the actual content of the film? Yeah, uh, absolutely, mate. So we see in the opening, I, like, I really love the opening of the film because it feels incredibly nostalgic to me. It does, yeah. Uh, and I, I sort of wish that the rest of the film had followed its structure of having a mist, like a legitimate mystery. Yeah. Uh, the reminiscent of the cartoons. Yeah. Like a, a classic unmasking and like the group working together and stuff. Like that is inherently what Scooby Doo is about. So that's sort of, I'm, like, I have basically the, the same thing in my notes. Like, great opening as well. Mm hmm. Uh, Obviously, we see how the the mystery gang uh, interact with each other, and just Fred is a colossal douche. Yeah, I mean, Fred is is in the cartoons my favorite member, but in the films he's my least favorite member. Which shows how much of a disservice they did, I think, especially in the opening scene and and, and other scenes we'll see later on. Like, uh, he's he just is he's just so arrogant. Yeah, like when you compare this guy to like Fred of Mystery Incorporated, it like it's a stark contrast because you know all he wants to do is like you know look at Daphne and build traps. Yeah. But in this, like, but in this, uh, you know, he can't get past like how good he looks in an ascot. You know, like yeah, he he seems to have no regard for anyone else. Yeah, there's like I hope that I, is a wig he's wearing as well, isn't it? Oh, it's horrific. I it hope that's bad. a wig. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> but like what one question like who is your favorite member on of the gang generally it, it, like in this film oh in this film it's difficult because like there's they're sort of like all inept dickheads so, like i don't really <laughs> like any of them uh i yeah. suppose daphne 
is my favorite because she she's sort of the only one that actually shows like an evolution between like the two year time jump. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. You know, I, I'm a I'm I'm a Velma fan. Linda Cardellini is an absolute delight in these films. Just gonna say. Oh, uh, undoubtedly, but yeah, I sort of think. She, I mean, she makes a point to be like, "Oh, it was my plan." Like in the opening, yeah. I'm like, "Yeah," which and it took all of you to execute it. Like you know, you, he like Fred is taking sole credit for it, but she's sort of like, "I should get sole credit for it." Mm-hmm. So like, I don't like either of them because you know they they both like neither of them recognize the importance of teamwork. Yeah, like. Do you think the group sort of disbanding, like, did that feel rushed at all to you? Or do you think, like, it was well-paced generally? I mean, I think if you know the characters, like, you sort of have, like, a really, like, a a good feel of their history. And, like, the opening scene is enough to give you context for why they would want to break up. Yeah. But I think if you're coming into this fresh with no knowledge of Scooby-Doo, you're like, who are these characters and why don't they? Like, why why are they breaking up? I, I, I don't think if you... I think without the context of knowing the characters, it would seem really rushed. Yeah, no, 100%. I think you've nailed it on the head. Like, re- regardless of, like, the pacing of the film, like, massive props to whoever casted these actors. Like, they're all just, they're just exactly, and they sound exactly like, I, I, I'm sure there is a lot of, like, I'm sure um, Matthew Lillard has probably voiced Shaggy as well in other, in other cartoons he, and stuff. He's Shaggy. Uh, he's been the permanent voice of Shaggy for... Uh, it's something like it's it's over ten years. Wow! Like yeah, like ev- everyone is great. Like, it's just how I how I would have imagined them in live action. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, th- I think what it, you know, if you're talking like definitive betrayals, I, I I agree. I think Matthew Lillard is the the most impressive. I think he encapsulates the character most. Absolutely. And I think Fred, Prince Junior is probably the bottom of that. Yeah, no, yeah, he's definitely the weakest casting, but I, I still think he's, he's, he's decent. Six or seven, I would say. Like, he's, he's, he's good, he's good. Okay. <laughs> Any other points about the opening then, bud? Well, you know, as, as I said, like, throughout the film, you know, they're, like, they are just depressed adults, and I, I just don't get it. Like, I, I really don't, don't understand why they wouldn't have put them in their prime. Yeah, like, do you think it sort of saps some of the sort of the, the enjoyment of the film to make them sort of split ways early on, you know, for them to be more, like, they're not, they're, I would say, I would argue probably in the second film, they're more themselves than in the first film. So it, I do agree, like, it did feel sort of weird to ha- not have them in their prime. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hardly like a Scooby-Doo team film if you just, like, scatter the characters immediately. You know, yeah. I, I just, I just, Get the togetherness in this film that is so present in the second film. Yeah, hundred percent. Like s- some of the professions that they go on to, like, are super are quite funny. Like, Fred's an author now. Daphne, <laughs> Daphne's doing martial arts to like <laughs> mm. to uh, you know fight kidnappers. And I, what does who does Belma work for? I think it's like a space agency or something. Is it NASA? It is NASA, isn't it? Yeah. Why does she give <laughs> up to, like return to mystery solving? <laughs> like that seems like a pretty good job, you know, not a dog right. or something. But hey, she is the she is the smart one of the group. She is the smart. Like, well, what are your opinions? Like the stereotypes of the of the characters. Like, do you, do you think it ages well? You know, like Shaggy's sort of like the goofy one. Fred's the cool jock. Daphne's the pretty one, and Velma's the smart one. Like, what what are your opinions on that? I th- I mean, I think realistically, you know, in in real life, you don't see such drastically different people getting on well. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, you know, it sort of lacks believability, but you know, it, it, like I, I don't dislike it. You know, I, it, like they all serve a purpose within the mystery gang. So I get why they work as a cohesive team. I just think as friends, I, I don't know how I can, you know, grasp the believability of that. Yeah, I think that it is quite, it is quite stark. Like a stark contrast, but it does, I think they do like mesh together well, and especially like the the actors do have good chemistry for the most part. So like props to them. What what baffles me is that the people who have the least chemistry are Fred and Daphne, who were married in real life. Yeah, like uh, is it Freddie Prince Jr. and Sarah Michelle Geller? Yeah, yeah, like like I I was gonna uh, I, I was gonna save this hot take 
for later and later on, but I suppose save, I could save it for later. Save it for later. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. okay, right. Uh, yeah, any other, I'm happy to just go by your points generally, mate. So. Well, I just want to talk about uh, Scooby Doo and his CGI. Yeah, what do you think? Per or okay? Oh, for the time, I think it's really impressive. Okay, okay. I you, you don't, you don't, I mean, you know, you look at you look at today and you see like the Lion King, and the, those those animals are obviously you know incredibly photorealistic, but they lack all expression. But I mean, you know, they like these people in two thousand two were able to make you know a pretty good looking CGI model that is also able to emote. So I, I think that's quite impressive. Yeah, like what one thing I, I will say as well, like. Um... I, I was watching Mr. Sunday Movies, uh, Caravan of Garbage on this film, and he he had pointed out that um, Matthew Lillard, I think it was this video, like Matthew Lillard wasn't like he wasn't he was acting to nothing basically, so like I, I don't think there was any like guy uh, like guy in like a green suit or anything or like with like polka dots all over him or anything. It was just Matthew Lillard acting to thin air, and I, I think that works well as, as well because like he's a very charismatic actor, so for for him to sort of portray that sort of realistic reactions to Scooby. I, I think I think he does a good job, but I don't know. I, I think the C obviously the CGI is not going to hold up today, but I, I'm not a fan of it, but I think in the second film it's it is better. I I, I have to disagree. I think it really holds up. I really? Think it's good. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. I Wait, think... I'm usually a, a CGI stickler, but like I I'm I'm really impressed, especially no, I, I'm glad to hear that. Track. I'm glad to hear that because Obviously, like a, a dog, especially like a talking like Great Dane, like that, that that would be quite hard to animate. So maybe, maybe I am being quite harsh because, like, I think they've definitely nailed the way like Scooby Doo like moves and stuff as well. And obviously in this film, like you see the sort of cartoon effects of them like running at super speed and them like dangling in midair like, when they fall through like a trap on the floor. So I, I think generally the animation the quality might not be for me, but I think the, the movement and like photorealism i guess is there so yeah in continuing the cgi train i kind of wanted to talk about the horrifically bad monsters effect <laughs> not great not great <laughs> oh, i mean downright horrific yeah like it does look like something from like five nights at freddy's or something or, or a video game of that like it, the video games are probably better but like they're generally shit <laughs> real bad <laughs> really bad I, I know the actors aren't acting to anything and that props them for that but even still like just in I, I how much was the budget for this film like 100 million around or i guess oh i i could not have told you it, w it would be nowhere near 100 million i i can look it up quickly but you know i just think i just think it would have been a much better idea for them to do prosthetics i agree yeah Definitely. You know, I, th I think that there's been, you know, incre incredible uh, monster prosthesis in film, and I, I, you know, I think they, I think they could have easily improved on uh, the character monster design. I mean, I know, I know you say about like performance, but that, like, that's never an issue for me. I think, you know, their their reactions to the monsters are, uh, you know, perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting because uh, have you got the budget? The budget was 84 million dollars 84 million so that's quite high for the time i'd imagine oh that's very high for the time but i assume a lot of that went to the cast yeah no true like it is a pretty like it is a pretty star-studded cast i i don't know if they were like really famous at the time or whatever but um i well, think for uh i assume ron At atkinson was riding high on mr bean at the time yeah, true yeah true what do you think of ron atkinson are you a fan of him in this film uh, I'm a fan of him in this film, but I, I'm, I'm usually not a fan, because uh, Mr. Bean, I would say, is one of the least funny things to come out of, uh, to come out of television. Really? You're not a Mr. Bean fan at all then, no? I, 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 don't, I don't know your thoughts, but to me, slapstick is the lowest form of comedy. Uh, and I, I've never enjoyed silent films, you know, I, I love dialogue and action, uh, so I, I was never a fan. Uh, I, I can definitely see how, how it wouldn't be to everyone's taste, for sure. But um, I, I, I've never had a lot of nostalgia for Mr. Bean, but like, 
you know, if it came on the TV, I'd probably watch it. Like, I do, I don't mind it, but it, it wouldn't be like it wouldn't be like you said, like my favorite form of comedy or anything. But yeah, it's it's, it's okay. So okay for kids. Like, I suppose it, like inherently, this film is also a kids' film. So like, we, we can't be too harsh on it. And I I've probably been too harsh on the CGI or whatever. But whether it holds up, I, mean, I, I whether it holds up, I don't know. But I don't know. The fact that it feels so much like a Scooby Doo cartoon for me is always a plus. So. Yeah, I agree with you, but I mean, I, I think it's okay to criticize because ultimately mo movies uh, that are made for children are also made for the parents who have to watch it with them. Good point. So I, I, you know, we should still expect a certain standard of quality. Yeah, no, that's a, yeah, fair enough, mate, fair enough. Like, I, obviously, like, Scooby-Doo, especially, like, the, the live-action films, like, they're never going to be, like, the, the pinnacle of filmmaking or anything, but I think, I, I think a kid or, like, a, a parent could watch this and like serviceably enjoy it like it's 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 decent it's decent yeah i mean the like the, you know obviously because we're not children we're, we're not we're not gonna quibble about uh you know all the fart jokes because i'm sure i'm sure as a kid i was like rolling about laughing at that <laughs> and you know that, that that's one part of the film where i'm like okay this is a kid's film and i can't really criticize that for being what it is yeah uh, but what, where i do think we can criticize it is you know believability and cgi and quality of writing yeah what do you think of the writing like do you think the script's good because there are some banging lines in this that just are a marvel to behold <laughs> please, please share well one of my favorites is fred and velma when fred goes i'm a man of substance and dorky chicks like you turn me on too <laughs> this is like fred he's really sexed up in this film like do you get that as well yeah he's he's a horny dude like he you know <laughs> like when when like pamela anderson like from baywatch rolls in in the mystery <laughs> machine i was so baffled i was like i i had no idea what was going on like just the 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 like baffling use of celebrities in this film it was just astounding i i just didn't i didn't get it that's probably where most of the budget went as well. Like, just to get Pablo Anderson hey, in for a quick cameo. And Sugar Ray. Sugar, oh. <laughs> oh, God. Like, I don't know what it, like, Fred, like, I think Fred's, like, corniness is, like, dialed to 11 in the second film. Like, this doesn't even pink Fred for me. But um, there's just so many classic, like, Scooby-Doo. Like, the second one probably has equally the amount of good, like, Scooby-Doo lines. But, you know, like... There are some absolute bangers, not even going to lie. <laughs> I mean, like, when they're together, yeah, I feel the quality of writing is good because it, it feels inherently like Scooby-Doo, you know, it, feel, it feels authentic, yeah. despite this being sort of, like, a weird, horny Elseworlds version. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I still think it feels authentic. Like, I'm, I'm really interested to hear your opinion on, during, like, chase scenes or action scenes in this film, like the remixes of the Scooby-Doo theme tune? Like, do you think that works? Yeah, I'm quite, I'm quite a fan, actually. Uh, you know, I, yeah, I, I like hearing the original uh, theme tunes you, you, of cartoons used in live action. Uh, but yeah, I, I, th I thought sort of the number of remixes was needless. You know, I thought pick, pick one and stick to it. Yeah, I suppose at least if they're remixing, it's one of the better theme tunes on children's TV. Yeah, I mean, like, what what do you think is the ultimate Scooby Doo theme tune? What's new, Scooby Doo? It's just the Fair. rock. It's just the rock element of it. I I quite liked. What about you? I mean, I love Mystery Incorporated, but uh, you know, obviously, it doesn't have lyrics, so you can't really judge it to the same standard. I suppose it's got a good beat. Like the the Mystery Incorporated one, if I can remember, it's quite. It's not the. Doo -doo -doo. Yeah, it's more. It's not. It's it's more subtle than the like the really intense. What's new, Scooby Doo? Like Mystery Incorporated. I I know you you love that show, but it was it was good, wasn't it? Yeah, I started to watch it the other day. Yeah. And it, it is still it is still fantastic. Yeah, because I'm actually not confident that I ever finished season two. It's got such a like amazing story. I don't. It just reminds me of like an animated Riverdale. I just get those sort of vibes from it, and I just. Just, oh yeah, hundred hundred percent. Yeah, sort of like the the teen mystery solvers and sort of like weird, creepy old people. Like there's there's a yeah. lot of that. Yeah, and like the fact that for the most part it's just set in the one town of 
is it Crystal Cove or am I or Coolsville? Crystal Which one Cove. Is it? Is, but in the one There's in the Crystal film, in uh, Mystery Incorporated, but every other iteration is Coolsville. Yeah, but you know, like it's it's fantastic. I, I don't know if it's your favorite uh, show, Scooby Doo show. What is your favorite Scooby Doo show, actually? Yeah, it's it's got to be Mystery Incorporated. Yeah, good, good man. Yeah. I mean, um, to be fair, like okay. uh, I don't, I I doubt you've ever seen a pop named Scooby Doo. Never. But it, it has it has sort of a, a classic charm. It's it's like it's the characters, and they're like seven or eight years old. Oh really? Yeah, and like Fred is just like a complete prejudiced prejudiced fuck's it prejudiced. <laughs> <laughs> My God. I mean, I'm this keeping is, that this in. Yeah, this is what happens when you don't speak to people every day. Like you lose the <laughs> language. Uh, yeah. So like, the, there's one kid with like red hair, uh, and his name, his his name, uh, get this, is Red Herring. Uh, because, <laughs> Mark is like, because every, every crime that happens, Fred just assumes he did it, even though he's never guilty. Like he's just, he's just this always innocent child. The the like Fred clearly just thinks isn't good looking, and he's like guilty. <laughs> you know what it is like. I think the Scooby Doo franchise in general is one of those where you can just go in so many different directions. Like I, I think it would work really well as an Elseworlds story. Like you, you could even like age them up or some. I don't know if this has been done, but like you know, like you said in that show, like they're all sort of younger but I, I think it, it would equally work as well of just have them in their like mid 30s or something and they come back together for one last mystery i, I think that would work as well because there's so many different directions you could go with like a mystery show as well so yeah yeah definitely i mean you could do something sort of like you know what they're doing with ghostbusters afterlife where you have them in the background and then their kids forming a new uh mystery inc yeah i, because... I think i could easily be done with this cast like i think they could easily have be so much you know, fun. Yeah. They're, they're forming a new group. That'd be great because that was sort of the element, one of the elements of Mystery Incorporated, wasn't it? Because they were like the second Mystery Incorporated, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, let, let's we, we won't give uh, too many spoilers about that, but you know, yeah, there was themes to do with lineage and stuff, and they were the the yeah the sec the second iteration of uh, the original Mystery Incorporated. Yeah, and yeah, they like... all sort of same stereotypes. Yeah, like it's it's just so such an interesting sort of you know universe that you can just go so many different directions in. You know, like I don't know what what are your opinions on like, the general like plot of this film? Like, I I know we're probably gonna go chronologically, but generally, like, do do you think it it works as like a Scooby Doo mystery or not really? Oh, not at all. I I I really don't like this film very much. Yeah. Uh, but we'll we'll we'll, we'll go we'll uh, maybe leave the main crux of the film until later, uh, and do I just go chronological? Yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't have much to say along the lines of uh, the middle of the film. Uh, I don't I don't know what you had. No, but like uh, just generally, like, and this sort of harkens back to Scooby Doo episodes. The middle of the movies and episodes, there's there's sort of like a lull, I guess, in most of them because you know the main integral parts of the mystery or at the start and at the end when they like unmask them and stuff so yeah not not particularly just i just wanted to commend the film and the terrific set set design for the most part especially in, like the house of horrors and spooky island like it, it really works and um uh, what other, yeah like there are there are a few like nitpicks here and there i can say about the script but not not nothing nothing major really uh, and obviously with mystery films like you get the odd e exposition scene and stuff like that uh which here in, comes in the form of a video that says training at, training video so that is stupendous I still, don't, I still don't understand how that comes into play because it turns out that there is no brainwashing cult uh because yeah. people are just getting their soul sucked out of their body so like who who is that training video for is that <laughs> is that for the staff like, I, I don't understand. <laughs> there must be <laughs> like, like I, I guess it's like you you know like the bald guy and the wrestler and the wrestler i guess those were the, the people who had been brainwashed by scrappy do yeah what are your opinions on scrappy do uh, i have a question for it like do you think he's the jar jar binks of this film oh yes i i agree so much with that that's such a good that's such a good comparison but you you don't mind jar jar binks no i quite like jar jar binks but in this film i think uh 
Well, I actually don't know much about Scrappy Doo in the lore or lore of Scooby Doo at all. Like, is he Scooby's brother or nephew or something, or what? What? what yeah, he he was introduced. Uh, I it, it was in one of the second, like second or third series. It was called uh, Scooby Doo and Scrappy Doo, I think. Okay. And it had just Scooby Doo, Scrappy, and uh, Shaggy from memory. Uh, I I th- that that's roughly right. Uh. And it was really shit. And he's he's always been a terrible character. And that that that's where I think this film is a, a parody on purpose. Because obviously, uh, when writing it, they've recognized this is a terrible character uh, who's like a real piece of shit and everyone hated. Let's absolutely dial that up to eleven and make yeah. a, like make him a joke. Which is why like he like pisses on Daphne uh, to show that he's like always been a piece of shit and everybody hates him. Yeah, like, I guess the, the main plot of the film from Scrappy Doo's sense is, like, he's just looking revenge and stuff, and, like, that's where I sort of want to say, like, there's no real mystery in a classic Scooby-Doo sense. It's more of, like, a, you know, in, in a classic Scooby-Doo sense, there's always, like, no real connection, for the, for the most part, between, like, the gang and the villain, but in this, it's, like, a, a revenge arc, so to speak, and for, for him to... I, I, like there's there is so many like potholes and stuff like that, but even still, um, yeah, this is the Scrappy Doo character. It, it's not something that I think it's a one time it's a one time thing. Like I, I'm glad they sort of like didn't go back to it again. Mm. But I mean, he he is quite an obscure character, so I'm surprised that in the first film that's that's who they chose to introduce because it's it's not a character that many people are familiar with. Yeah, like, I guess, that, like you said, like, the film does make a few unusual choices, especially with the start of them, for, like, for them to disband, and as well to use Scrappy Doo as the, as the villain of the film, so, yeah, like, I, as I said, like, I, I don't know much about the character, but, you know, for him to be not that noteworthy of a character in the lore of Scooby Doo, I guess it was quite an unusual decision. At least it shows that the, maybe, like, fans of the, of the lore that they, they decided to use him. Yeah. I mean, I, I like I understand that he wanted to get revenge, but you know, invite them separately and murder them. Don't don't like assemble them to like don't assemble like the dream team to take you down. Yeah, he's just asking for trouble there, really, isn't he? Yeah, I, I just don't get that at all, really. <laughs> and sort of like with what you said, like I have never been a fan of like the supernatural Scooby Doo stories. Like I like a straight up mystery where there's like a culprit that is a human. Yeah, you know this that's you know doing doing something uh illegal or uh mysterious you know that that that's where i think scooby-doo really shines like I, i've never liked anything to do with like aliens or monsters like real monsters yeah no i'm completely with you mate 100 percent uh, i think scooby-doo as a franchise really thrives with like an arc that derives from an actual sort of human interaction and like a human mystery but that, that's not to say like there can't be good supernatural elements but I don't think it's that well executed here. I, even for like some of the humor, like with the soul, soul swapping stuff, like the first thing Fred says when he gets into Daphne's body is like, hey, I can look at myself naked. I can't believe that I got into the script. That I got into the final film. Like, I, is, I, I, I can't say that, that into a kid's film. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I think doing something that like where there's no build up to the reveal of the villain like i think that sort of like robs the audience of like the who done it where they can guess the the identity you know because yeah. no one was going to think like one scene with scrappy doo would lead to him being the the villain you know i think you needed to like you know ha- have some more establishing clues yeah no i 100 percent agree and i suppose like with most scooby doo films like well, and, and TV shows like there's the classic bait and switch where you know you, you think it's um you think it's Rowan Atkinson's character what's his it's like Emil uh, he's got a really weird surname Mondavarius, Mondavarius yeah and uh like it's the classic you know tear off the mask and tear off the other the another mask but um yeah like in general what were your opinions on the mystery because it, as you said like it is more of a supernatural tale than than anything yeah, I, th- I think it's like bitter, bitterly lacking a mystery. Uh, you know, I sort of felt, oh, obviously I, I've seen this film many times over the years, so I, I of course knew how it ended. Uh, 
And yeah, I'm I'm just I'm I'm quite disappointed looking back on it now because I, like as a, as a viewer uh, like who wasn't a child, I I would want more. I you know I'd want a ch- a chance to guess who who was the villain. Yeah. So how 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 do you feel as like an adult looking like watching it for the first time? I can understand the value of it for classic Scooby Doo fans. Like I I think classic Scooby Doo fans probably can admire it for you know. For, for the most part, following the lore of the characters, you know, obviously they've got the classic mystery machine, really well cast, all the costumes and, and sort of like characteristics of these individuals are very, very like the source material. So in that, in that sense, I can appreciate it. Uh, and obviously for it being a kid's film, a, ki- a kid could very well enjoy it, you know, but yeah, in terms of like mystery and overall plot, I, I thought, I, as you said, I, I do think it was lacking a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So did you, did you have any further points or did you want to move on to ratings? I'm happy to move on to ratings, mate. What would you give it out of 10? I'm struggling because, you know, I have to recognise its value for children and its enjoyment value. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a fun romp, especially with, like, I, th- I think Matthew Lillard for the majority of the film carries it because he's, he's so charismatic. And to, to me, he's the definitive Shaggy. And he, he's the voice of Shaggy, uh, aside from... Uh, Casey Kazim that I that I grew up w- uh, with as a child, so I'm I'm gonna have to give it like a six and a half. That's yeah, I I respect that. I I'd, I'd give it a six, similar. I'd I'd give, I'd give it a six. Um, I think it does a lot of things well. What one sort of question I missed out on asking you, uh, or forgot about rather, was how old are they supposed to be in this film? Uh, teens or t- early twenties? Oh, I have no idea because they all look embarrassingly embarrassingly old. Like. For example, like Freddie Prince Jr. is only like twenty six in this film, but he looks forty. <laughs> like it's shocking, and it's, I think it's the so wig embar- makes him look older. Yeah, but like it's also just embarrassing when he has like you know bleach blonde hair and he's calling people dog. Like it's just so uncomfortable <laughs> for me. <laughs> like he feels yeah. like my, like he feels dad, and I I just I think they are in the in the opening scene meant to be teenagers, which is astounding. I mean, I think like Matthew will Matthew Lillard and Freddie Prince Jr. especially look just forty years old. I think I think Linda Cardellini and Sarah Michelle Gellar could pass, but like you said, Freddie Prince and Matthew Lillard absolutely not. <laughs> yeah, like I I think they're meant to be probably eighteen in the opening and then twenty twenty in the you know in in the rest of the film. Sure, and if that's the case, I I I, I do. I think that like makes the film lack all authenticity. Yeah, no, hundred percent, mate, hundred percent. Did you want to move on to Scooby Doo Monsters Unleashed? Yeah, sure. Cool. So, go ahead. Yeah. Is the is this the first time that you've seen this film as well? Yep. Uh, well, funny story. I have seen. I did see this film as a child, but for some reason, I only remember watching the ending of the film. So, okay. In a weird way, I have seen it before, but I I, I don't remember the first three quarters, but. Having rewatched it, um, it's it was certainly an interesting one, and for to say the least. Okay, so I I wanted to open my thoughts with a, a new little segment. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm I'm excited. I'm excited. This, this is my this is one of my brother's favorite films, and I honestly can't tell whether he's being sarcastic or not. Uh, I think I think to to a certain degree it is. So so I have a little section called Jake's Takes. <laughs> <laughs> love it, mate. Love. It. Can we have this in every episode? Jake's takes that. That works marvelously. Well, I'll, I'll, we'll we'll definitely have it on uh, his highlights. So if if we ever do the cat in the hat, uh, I'm sure I'm sure we'll be <laughs> uh, having some extensive thoughts from him. But he said uh, he is glad that they rectified the lack of cleavage in the first film in this one. Yep. <laughs> I, I, I asked him for some in depth thoughts. Uh, he is a 20 year old man. Uh, I'm embarrassed for him. I'm sure there's a lot of people that would agree with that as well. So, so some of the, so some of the older viewers, maybe, yeah. uh, forced to watch this with their kids. Uh, yeah, Jake's a strange dude. Let, let's move on. Love him. Love him. Uh, yeah. Do you think this film? What, what What are your opinions on this film generally? Like, you know, were were you happy that they made a sequel to it to the first one? Yes. I, I feel much more favorable towards this film than the first film. Me too. Uh, I feel like it improves in pretty much every single area. 
Great. I mean, it's still not necessarily good, but I, I definitely think it's Im- improved uh, upon uh, what came before it. No, I, I agree. Uh, I think it's the script's much... Well, the script's a little bit better. CGI is better for the most part. And um, I, 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 one thing I noticed in this film more than, more than the first one was the cinematic score. I, I thought the soundtrack was better as well. And je- I gen- think it's like really weirdly operatic like i don't think it matches the tone of the film at all no i sp- i suppose so like in some scenes it does certainly stick out and and as with like the scooby-doo remix of the theme but um like th- there's no like that there's no like real embarrassing like cameos necessarily uh as much as the first one um and well, i mean j- there's that whole like embarrassing dancing sequence uh in the criminals bar with yeah I, th- I think they're called like Big Brother or something. <laughs> and um, yeah, like I think generally, as you said, things are more improved in the first. I think th- like the the more mystery element is more honed in on this film, which, which we'll which we'll get on to a bit later. Mm. Yeah. So the the film opens with uh, the the gang visiting uh, the museum where they can arrogantly look at all of their achievements. Look what uh, we've done. <laughs> and, yeah, and it's it's very strange because we see that like Velma, Daphne, and Fred are just the least loyal friends you could you could hope for. They're just complete assholes. Uh, I like feel they, so bad know, for Shaggy and Scoob. <laughs> I know they're, they're basically told that they're completely useless, even though like Shaggy saved everyone in the first film, and they like they all took credit from him. Yeah, like. Oh, what was I going to say? Yeah, like, it, it's baffling to me how they, them three, are, like, taking credit for all this. And another thing I sort of wanted to ask you in reference to the museum thing was, like, I'm baffled how much press and, like, fame these kids have got. Yeah, I know. Who would give a shit? Like, you know, it's not like they're catching more people than, like, an average, like, the average police officer. And yeah, they're not like, getting, you know, like, droves of uh press even though they should like i i get it like it's they're like the story of the town so to speak but like a whole museum segment of, about them i was just like I what? But, hey. yeah it's uh, i mean you know i suppose we live in a society and an age where people are famous for nothing so i guess they're at least doing something good and getting praise for it it's yeah. better than you know a lot of people who do nothing and get famous i i, I suppose that's true like I wonder, could you probably couldn't get away with like forming your own mystery solving gang? Like, it's probably a vigil- under like vigilante law or something that you can't do it. Yeah, I was say, sign the Sokovia Accords. <laughs> I mean, it does seem to like go against people's human rights to like trap them in a net. <laughs> yeah, like there's. Oh, God. I just I'm really interested to know like, like where does fred get all the equipment to set up the traps like did... I, mean, I i i think you know i don't i don't really know where he got it like pre uh the first film but in the second film we see that they've like established a headquarters uh, so i guess maybe they they were able to hire people with an r d department so people just like engineers <laughs> yeah. built his trap for him yeah like one thing about the mystery incorporated tv show that I love so much is like Fred's love of traps over Daphne. That is just marvelous, marvelous work. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, did you have any further thoughts on uh, the museum or the start of the film? Um, not really. My most of my notes are sort of like the middle on on the action scenes, really. But there's there's one sort of scene towards the start of the film uh, after the attack in the museum when um they're sort of investigating a house and a kid on a bicycle says nice hey nice job last night losers <laughs> i was just like wow <laughs> wow I, like i i wish as a child i had the confidence to say that me too me too <laughs> yeah what what i didn't enjoy sort of about the mystery solving aspect of this film was that the first person that they suspect like turns out to be the culprit you know they go oh it's probably jonathan jacobo and then they're right yeah you know i i think i think that sort of like that 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 robs like once again robs the viewer of an investigation of their own 
you know, you should, you should present so, like a few culprits, but like the, the first and like the, there's only really three culprits presented as possibilities. And the first one that they mention it like turns out to be the yeah. right one. It's funny. Uh, I, 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 that was a mistake. Yeah, I 100% agree. Like, it's really funny you say that because I think that's something we can both agree on. Um, uh, Knives Out has a similar problem with, you know, they, they spoilers for Knives Out, by the way, in case, uh, uh, in case you haven't seen it, but, you know, they sort of portray Ransom as like sort of a, a rebellious member of the family and it turns out he's, you know, the main culprit. So I think that is an issue that this film has as well. And also that um, Jacobo... Uh, well, I don't know what it is about Tim Blake Nelson, but he, I, th he just has one of those. Uh, he just has an aura about him that, like, he can play an excellent villain. You know. I mean, he's it. He's in a, a grand total of two scenes, uh, so I, I don't really think he commands the screen as much as you no. think he does. But yeah, uh, his accent work, uh, ten out of ten. Ten out of ten. Ten out of ten. Any film I've but, seen him in, he's sort of like a villain. So. Yeah, so would that would that be like the Incredible Hulk, Fantastic Four, and this? Yep, <laughs> yep. exactly. Uh, that. But like, I I think that the best mode of like creating a story is presenting two or three potential culprits and then laying the groundwork for it actually being someone else without overtly saying their name, like as as a potential as a potential uh, you know suspect. I you know and then the viewer can pick up on that subtext themselves. Yeah, because I suppose otherwise it just becomes blatantly obvious. Uh, who, yeah, who is really which is, there. I suppose it's fine for a kid's movie, but I mean, even in like the animated films, this isn't a problem. You know, I, like, I'm always satisfied with the mystery of the Scooby-Doo animated films. Yeah, 100%. 100%, dude. Is this an embarrassing thing to be talking about as adults? Like, are we, are we reading way too into this? No, no. This is fun. This is this is what the movie myths are all about. Yeah, recast, re recapturing that childhood innocence. <laughs> absolutely, bro. Absolutely. Any other points you'll have to mention about the sort of the middle bit of the film? Yeah. So you, you, you've talked you've talked about them sort of uh, infiltrating uh, the the mansion, and uh, I just wanted to you know have a little observation. Uh, you know, the the Black Knight ghost clearly doesn't have a middle, but he has balls they can kick. <laughs> Yeah, that was one of the jokes that I thought fell completely flat as an adult, uh, as it probably would. But uh, yeah, like, like that uh, somehow that hurts him. Yeah, I mean, like his torso is like floating on green gas, and like he has <laughs> balls. <laughs> I love it. Like, there's, I think it's in that scene, like Daphne just casually slides down a banister on her feet, like just surfing on the banister. I was just, like, wonderful. Yeah. She is like. Like, to be fair, like, I can understand why, you know, Daphne, wh why they would want to give her a more, like, action-focused role in the film, because in the cartoons, like, uh, like Daphne has been stereotyped as, like, the damsel in distress, so I, I do respect the film for, like, giving her more to do. Yeah, I, th I think that this is uh, pro probably, to it, like, at that point in the Scooby-Doo canon, this was probably the most respectful uh, and representative view of the female characters. I, I think this is where they're given, uh, you know, the, the the best and most productive role. Absolutely, absolutely, man. You know, like, I yeah, I you know, they they were often uh, stereotyped in the very early cartoons, and it's gotten much more progressive in recent days. But I think this is probably uh, the first instance of you know, true respect given to all of the characters. Absolutely. Like, one thing I'm really interested to hear is, like, your thoughts on Velma and Patrick's romance. See, yeah, I, I find, the, like, the message of her arc quite confusing because, sort of, it's a strange mix of, like, be who, you know, be the person that they think you are, which can be an okay thing, you know, sort of, like, perpetuating the, the best thing about yourself that they want that they see in you, not yeah. that they want you to be but what they see in you. Sure. And like change yourself dramatically to fit into what they think you are. Yeah. It sort of like, like you know? blurs the lines between them, doesn't it? Yeah, I was confused by that because sort of all the characters seem okay with the way she changes herself, uh, until the end where she says, I'm gonna be myself and Patrick is like, I wouldn't want you to be any other way. 
so up, up until the end, uh, I felt sort of dubious about that arc, but uh, I, I felt more comfortable and clear on it by the end. Yeah, like what one of the more heartwarming scenes in the franchise for me was like sort of Velma's insecurity in herself and like Daphne trying to like sort of help that and trying to nurture that. Uh, but, but then she, I spe- it's just what is it? Like da- Daphne is meant to be like portrayed as like nurturing and caring and you know thinking of Velma, and then she clearly misses the mark quite significantly. That's why I mean. she sort of encourages Velma to change herself. Yeah, like, it's just completely ruined by, like, Velma coming down the stairs and, like, asking, who's your mommy? <laughs> like, it was... Uh, <laughs> like, so uncomfortable. They just put her in, like, a, a skin-tight sort of spandex s- suit, pantsuit. It was weird. Yeah, and then it's revealed that she's wearing a turtleneck under it. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, no, like... For me, like Velma is my favorite character in this in this film in the, like these two films. So, um, I, I'm sort of glad she got the character development, even though it was somewhat confused. Yeah, uh, I I wanted to ask you. Obviously, we see uh, we we see Scooby and Shaggy infiltrate uh, the bar for criminals, and I w- I just wanted to ask you: uh, Do you think it's a normal occurrence that uh, criminals disco dance? <laughs> No, but maybe maybe in this film, like <laughs> that was that was a weird one because like most of them seem like really cheery cheery guys and gals, but then you know behind the scenes they could be committing some illegal acts, so it is hard for us to judge. Yeah, I mean, I suppose you have to think about it from the perspective that they've always been like costumed zany villains, but I mean, co- the costumed zany villains have probably committed murder. Yeah, I know. And that's where it sort of like draws the line a bit from like humorous to they shouldn't have been in the film. <laughs> yeah. What what is what are your thoughts on like Scooby and Shaggy like and the, and the sort of cuz one scene I really enjoyed was them like drinking the different potions and like Shaggy gets jacked. I <laughs> quite like that. Yeah, I sort of Yeah, I, I I didn't love that scene, but you know, I always loved seeing their interactions. Uh because I, I, I find that Shaggy was my favorite character in these two films. Because yeah. I, I think he's the truest to himself from, uh, like for, from, the, from the cartoons. And I think he's the most consistent character across the two films. Yeah, like one of the, uh, absolutely, mate, like Matthew Lillard is, he really understands the character, I think, from the lore. Like you can tell he's a fan, I think, as well, which is, which is great. And, um, yeah, which, it's so disappointing because he, he was so... He was really upset to find out that they had cast someone else in the new film because it's the first time in anything in the last, I think it's more than 10 years. I think it was something like 12 or 13 years that he's been permanently voicing wow. Shaggy in it. and they, 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 ca- they recast. That's really like disheartening because, you know, it sort of goes against the grain of, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, Matthew Lillard's been doing an exceptional, exceptional, uh, role there shaggy and who who actually is the voice cast of this I, i'm um, i think was zach efron in there as fred or is that am i making yes, up zach efron is fred amanda seyfried is daphne uh will forte is shaggy and velma is gina rodriguez okay okay like that that sounds i have to assume it's frank welker still as scooby what what's the jet like? This is sort of like a side a side note from the actual um, Scooby Doo two. But like, what is the gen gen general plot of that film? Is it um, are they the same age roughly? Are they teens or are they a bit younger? Uh, I th- I think a lot of, like some of it is a look back to their childhood and how they met, and then it's them as teenagers, and then I know that they get recruited by like the Blue Falcon, uh, who is sort of that that universe's version of Batman. Okay, uh, I think. I think they're recruited by him, played by Mark Wahlberg. Uh, oh. <laughs> we all know uh, about Mark Wahlberg, don't we, Cal? I mean, the viewers don't, because that episode that we recorded uh, mentioning him went in the bin. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> Mark, Mark, Mark Wahlberg, uh, not a person that I like, uh, will be yeah. voicing the Blue Falcon. And then I, I think they, they're working together to foil like the, the plan of like a classic Hanna-Barbera villain, Dick Dastardly. Did you want to do that? Sounds fun. Like, do you want to do a mini review on that or something? Oh yeah, like that. That that is why uh, 
I, I had us doing the Scooby Doo movies okay, good. to You're good. preempt that film. Awesome, awesome. Uh, I'm looking the... forward to. I am disappointed uh, to hear that Matthew Lillard kind of felt a bit blindsided by that. I know, because he he seems like a generally like nice guy as well. And although to be fair, like the animation for Scoob does look pretty good. Gotta hand it to them. Yeah, it's quite it's quite out there and unorthodox for Scooby Doo, but it, it is sort of reminiscent of a pup named Scooby Doo, but with obviously cleaner CGI rather than two D animation. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose because I, I think Scooby Doo is one of those things that like it it really suits the hand drawn style as well because you know it, it does especially in like the sixties as well like the classic you know hand drawn I, I maybe this is just me like nostalgia speaking but I I think it I think three D animation in some instances works but I I I, I do prefer the hand drawn stuff. What, what what about you? Yeah, I would say Pixar is one that really benefits from using 3d mm-hmm. uh like obviously toy story is one of the very first instance instances of a feature-length film being made with 3d animation sure uh but yeah i, th- I think sort of like classic disney and you know spider-man and superheroes in general i, th- I and scooby-doo i think they all benefit from 2d animation like i i would much rather watch a 2d animated uh tv series at least yeah Absolutely, mate. Hundred percent agree with you. Hundred uh, percent. Any other points about the mid midpoint of the film, mate? Or um, I'm just happy. Well, to throughout the film, uh, obviously, we see uh, the creations of the masked man, uh, yeah. which are which are all uh, based on the museum exhibits, being very classic Scooby Doo villains, and I love that so much. I love that too. Like, like there's just. So much nostalgia as well for the, you know those those classic ghosts or, or like I suppose they are ghosts in a sense. Like um, what 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 is your favorite one in the film? Out of curiosity, so I'm a, I'm a big fan of the uh, I like the Black Knight, but I also quite like the uh, is it like the Vault Monster or something? Yeah, I think is it like the ten thousand volt ghost or something. Yeah, I quite like I quite like that his design. I think it looks quite cool. Yeah, I have to say the the CGI is incredibly impressive on that. Yeah, I, I'd probably go for those two favorites. You know, not they're not necessarily my favorite villains that have been in the cartoons, but character design wise, those are yeah. both incredible. Absolutely, I I actually think the mix of like I assume there is like a mix of prosthetics. Uh, and CGI for the ghosts in general, so I, I think it works well for the most part. And it's a vast improvement on the monsters of. Oh yeah, hundred percent, mate. Hundred, like it's actually scary. Not not scary, but like it, it is actually like amazing how far it is it is coming. That in, in like what was it, two thousand two, two thousand five, two thousand four, something. Like that was such a short amount of time, and it, it really has drastically improved as well. Yeah. And generally, like I think the humor for this film is much better as well. Yeah, what well, one unintentionally hilarious moment I found was the motorcycle joist. Yes, <laughs> yes, and uh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> so we 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 see that uh, the the Black Knight ghost is approaching Freddy, and he like dramatically whips off uh, whips off the tarp from a stolen motorcycle as as though it's like from a classic western. And you sort of hear like the rise of the Western music, and he tightens his ascot. And I think it's—I mean, it must be shit intentionally, right? Must be. I hope so. <laughs> like, does the film want him to be a badass on a bike? Do you think? Like, do you think that isn't? I hope it's intentional. Hope so. Like, I really, I really hope he's like the, the director intended to make him look like an idiot. Like, I really hope that isn't meant to be like a badass moment. It's just the dramatic shot of him tying his ascot that does it for me. <laughs> yeah, like I, I hope it's sort of like the piss take of the character that it is in like Mystery Incorporated, where he thinks he's cooler than he is. Yeah, because I was, I always, I don't know if you got this, but I always find the character in Mystery Incorporated was he sort, he thinks he's like a jock, but he's actually like he's not that like stereotypical cool. You know, he he doesn't like stereotypically cool things like he, he likes making traps and solving mysteries like I, I don't think he's the jock that he thinks he is you know yeah he's like he's like built like a football player like he's huge in mystery incorporated but he's like he's he's nearly as big a nerd as velma yeah like well I, well 
I, will, there, I have two points here. One of them is my hot take, which I'll leave for later. My second okay. one is, um, do you remember in this episode of Mystery Incorporated when Daphne ends it with Fred or like ends their little fling together and like dates this guy who is absolutely shredded? Like he's got like what, what Daphne describes as babs, back abs. Yeah, his, his name's Baylor Hotner and he's based on Taylor Lautner. <laughs> like, I just love the way the the artist for that show had draw had gone out of their way to draw like a six pack on on his back. It was marvelous. But no, Fred's Jack, isn't he? Generally, Fred's Fred's huge. Yeah, he's, uh, he's his, his chest is big. Like his big. Yeah, but yeah, love Fred. But that that character is really interesting because they sort of made him like an engineering nerd. Uh, where yeah. you know obviously he build traps. And he, and again, he thinks he's cooler than he is. And I think that, I hope that's an intentional decision by the director uh, to make this character iteration like that. Yeah. Okay, so I've got a bit of a hot take, right? Generally in Scooby-Doo lore, and this has never really been a thing until I noticed it in this film, I ship Fr- Fred and Velma and Shaggy and Daphne. Oh, that, that is a hot take. Because I think there's serious undertones in this film of Fred liking Velma. Because, like, did, especially did, when she, like, steps out. More what is it, sorry? Did you see that more in the first one or the second one? I think there's certain undertones of it in the first film, but I think in this film especially, like, when she walks down the stairs and, like, he's sort of, like, t- taken aback as well. Like, ooh. Uh, but, like, g- generally, like, I think Fred and Velma are a better match than Fred and Daphne because, like, although Fred and Daphne, like, have a certain spark, I think, interest-wise, like, Fred- Fred's always been interested in, like, traps and, as you said, is nearly as nerdy as Velma. So I would like if that was explored in, in a certain project and I sort of think the... I, I think Daphne and and Shaggy would work quite well as well because they are sort of like opposites in a way because like Shaggy's like the stereotypical, you know, um, I guess like uncool, but I, I, I don't think he's uncool, but I think generally like that's the way he was written. But I, I think, uh, no, I, I think Daphne could help bring him out of his shell as well. And I, I, I'm not a big fan of the Shaggy Velma romance and Mystery Incorporated anyway. So no, I don't know. No. I don't know if you agree. I just... I just want. To, uh, what are your yeah. thoughts on that? I I definitely I definitely see the Fred and Velma connection, and I I think in a third film that should have been explored because I, I I think that they are a better match than him and Daphne, and despite him being married to Sarah Michelle Gellar, they have yeah, zero weird thing, but that's a weird thing. But I I I, I can't agree with you on the on yeah the Velma no and fair enough. They're, fair enough. I, I can understand why he wouldn't. I can understand why he wouldn't. But I, I, I would just, I don't know. I just, I'd like to see that explored or something. I mean, especially the Fred and Velma romance. I would like to see where they go with that. Yeah. So soon after the the motorcycle joist, uh, we witnessed quite a horrific act. I, I don't know if you, if if this hit you, but Shaggy and Scooby eat a sentient being. <laughs> yeah. Is that the uh, the candy floss guy? <laughs> yeah. The, the cotton candy glob. Yeah. <laughs> They kill like, him. <laughs> like, like they, they, yeah. they eat a they eat a living, existing being. <laughs> There's so like I I think especially that sort of action action set piece of the film, like towards the end. Like I I think most of it is very self aware. Like we we see with Fred and Joy. Well, I hope it is like Fred and the and his Joyce thing, and then you know that Shaggy and Scooby eating the cotton candy monster. And also, like, there's, there's a, f- like, Daph- some of Daphne's lines as well in that scene. Like, she goes, taste the pain, Mr. Glowy Ugly Thing, and then takes a fall that definitely should have snapped her neck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like, I wish it had. Oh, do you remember the, the scene in the first film where, like, the woman in the cage just throws a guy? Like, yeah. <laughs> what, what happened there? I mean, clearly, clearly like, in this universe, uh, you know, the laws of physics and gravity don't apply. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to the same degree, obviously, because, you know, Scooby and Shaggy can, like, grind down a mountain. <laughs> but I, I do agree with you. It's, it's a little jarring for them to eat a sentient being, like you said. Like, that's, that's dark. Yeah. Uh, so we see Velma happen upon a shrine of Jonathan Jacobo, which... Uh, follows with Patrick appearing and she assumes that it's his but but the fact that it isn't means that Jonathan Jacobo has a shrine to himself (laughs) 
Yeah, loves himself. <laughs> like he just has like candles and photos of himself. Like, oh, what a sexy, oh, like, a sexy you, boy. Do you think that was? I suppose it was intended to be like the classic bait and switch. But did you ever suspect Patrick's uh, if a uh, potential Patrick involvement, even though he wasn't? I have to assume that as a child, I just, uh, I, I, I just had no suspicion. Just went, yeah, it's him. Yeah, me, but if I would have seen, I'd probably been the same. Yeah. yeah. Like, what, what are your opinions on, like, Jacobo's design? Because it, it sort of reminded me, and this isn't necessarily a criticism, but it kind of reminded me of, like, an old Power Rangers villain, sort of the way the, the mask moved as well. Oh, do you mean, like, his, his sort of original effort where he was robbing banks? Well, yeah, 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 that, that as well, yeah. I, yeah, I, th- I, think, uh, I think that was really cool. It was sort of how I would have liked to see uh, the Vulture in, yeah. like, Spider-Man 4. Yeah, with yeah. The, the the wings that are sort of just made of springs. <laughs> yeah, I think, does, you know. I think it looked cool. Yeah, and then sort of like the, you know, the clawed feet that like mm. were able to pick things up. Yeah, I, no, I, I, thought, like I thought it. Those... I liked it. Can, can I ask, like, who did you suspect uh, the, the culprit was? Not gonna lie, I thought because, I, I was thinking Patrick could have been, could have been there, you, but... You, you, you blindly believed. No, because I, I thought halfway through, the, I thought it was curious that like, that he wanted to like pursue a romance with Velma, so, like to sort of like infiltrate the group, so to speak. But I don't know. Like, I suppose it. Like, did you see the Jacobo twist twist coming? I suppose, it, yeah. Like, I mean, we we can get on to like you know the ins and outs of the twist at the end, but I I suppose obviously now I knew how it ended. Uh, but I, as a child, I presume I did. I really did not expect how that how it ended. Yeah, like, it's the classic, like, bait and switch when, you know, I, I suppose kids would have thought, it's the journalist, but then, like, <laughs> rip off the mask, and it's Jacobo as well, so, yeah, like, I, I think it's more of an inherent Scooby-Doo mystery than the first film, for sure. Yeah, I agree with you. So, I, I'd say the, the final action set piece is obviously them uh, tossing the, the control panel to each other whilst uh, fighting the tar monster. And until now, I never recognized like the visual symbolism of of them playing frisbee as a team in the flashback scene, and then them playing frisbee uh, again as a team at the end. Yeah, I didn't know. Yeah, that's. I guess that's something that's really like hit me now as well. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Like, what are your opinions on the action scene in general? Like, do you think it works? Well, I mean, it doesn't work. You know, if, if you're thinking about realism, because why would a fire extinguisher freeze tar? Uh, but you know, if you sus- sort of suspend your scientific belief, uh, I thought I thought it was a, a fun romp. I thought so too. I-, I think the tar monster is right up there as one of the better monsters or goons in the film. So I thought, yeah, cool design, but um, yeah, the C- that's where the probably the CGI struggles the most, I would say. But still okay, still serviceable. Yeah, I mean that's sort of one thing where I think it falls down when you have an actual monster you know, made out of science rather, or science or magic rather than a guy in a suit. They sort of seem, like, without personality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I get that, because I think, oh, yeah, like, there's not really an aura about them, really. It's just a, you know, a a being that you have no real connection to, so you can't really, you can't really sympathize with it, really. So, I I get where you're coming from. Yeah. So, as you you mentioned, uh, it's revealed that the villain is both the journalist and Jonathan Jacobo. Yeah. Uh, I, I really don't think it needs both twists. Like, I think yeah. pick and stick to it. You know, don't, don't like sort of present like four suspects and have the villain be two of them. I, I, I don't know. I thought it was maybe just a bit too far for me. It was a similar vein to the first film, I suppose, wasn't it? It was like two unmaskings in one. So. Yeah. I mean, I just thought that you could sort of like have it just be the journalist and then give her like a backstory that links to Jonathan Jacobo. You don't have to make her Jonathan yeah, Jacobo. Yeah, like it's, it's his daughter or sister or something. I think that would have worked as well. Yeah, you know, give, give her a secret motive that the, 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 you know, that the audience couldn't predict. Like, I, I, I think I would have preferred that. Yeah, yeah. Like, would you have liked to see a third film? I would have loved to see a third film, especially hearing what it was going to be about. Oh, what was it going to be about? Uh, Enlighten me. It it was going to be about uh, a haunted town in Scotland uh, calls for Mystery Inc. to come and investigate. And you find out throughout the course of the film 
that the monsters are actually the victims uh, of Scooby and Shaggy's prejudice. <laughs> so, like, they, they have to, like, look within themselves at the prejudice against the monsters. That's like actually, it was, was going to be deep. Book. That's quite profound, actually. Yeah, I, I think I would have really loved that. I think it would have, you know, continued the progression that started, uh, you know, between the first and the second films. I think that would have been the best of the trilogy. Yeah, because, yeah, because um, I can't remember if maybe you'll, you can shed some light on this, but do you know the Scooby Doo animated movie, the Loch Ness Monster one? Yeah. Was it? Is it in the universe of what's new Scooby Doo? Yeah. Uh, it's with the same animation style and the same voice cast, but it's not in the same continuity. Okay, because I remember watching that, and I don't know. There's something about like setting a mystery in Scotland about that I, I quite enjoyed. So I would have liked to see like where they would go with that. So I suppose I'm, yeah. I'm glad it got cancelled. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's well established in this universe that monsters can be real. So, like, why can't they be real and also good? Yeah. So I, I, I think that that story would have proposed a lot of really good uh, philosophical questions. Absolutely, and especially like a lot of good twists, I'd imagine, in there as well. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you can't do exactly that, but I really don't think it's too late to do a Scooby Doo three with this cast because you know as, as i said earlier like you know they, they like these have really got like re-popular uh w- with time you know and as you said they they now have like sort of a, a cult fan base and you know that was enough to get like blade runner a sequel so i i don't see why this couldn't get you know a third a third film i think it would do really well and, and help boost the popularity of the of the scooby-doo franchise because I think even just age them up and just continue the plot of the third film would have worked just as well. Just say they're like really successful business people now on behalf of like the Mystery Inc. Corp- uh, corporation. So I think it could work. Absolutely, mate. I, d- I definitely don't think it's too late. No, definitely. Uh, especially the run of disappointing prequels. Yeah. Uh, like I, I, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's good. I, like it, it would be a good opportunity to revisit uh, this, this cast. Absolutely. Absolutely, bro. Did you want to head on into ratings then? Yeah. Yeah, sure. No worries. Uh, you know, I think it's definitely an improvement on the original, but, you know, ob- obviously it has improved CGI, improved writing, and the characters feel more consistent. But, you know, it's obviously still not good. Uh, it's it's obviously made for kids. The, this one even more so, because obviously they didn't have to sort of revision it to meet uh, the kids film criteria you know they sort of sure. knew that was the vision from the offset yeah uh so it, it doesn't have the hurdle of trying to like awkwardly re-edit itself so i i think i'd probably give it a solid seven i i'd have to agree with you mate seven for me as well i think it's much improved in the first one and like i could generally watch it and think yeah it works as a kid's film and obviously there's the the cringy humor here and there but you know films from early 2000s they're, they're never going to age gracefully so it's not uh, yeah like I, I do quite enjoy it and the fact that it's more of an inherent mystery and less of the supernatural stuff it's always a win for me yeah i fully agree so um yeah i think that let's should conclude the episode then bud yeah yeah so did you want to talk about uh the part two episode well yeah i'm i i actually don't know what movies <laughs> we're watching for that one so oh you're not uh so <laughs> For for the part two of this episode, we will be watching uh, Scooby Doo: The Mystery Begins. Okay. Uh, Scooby Doo: Curse of the Lake Monster. Is that the uh, lo- is that the Loch Ness monster one? It's it's not the Loch Ness monster. No. Uh, it's it's starring the same cast as The Mystery Begins, uh, and it's set at a golf course, uh, where where the lake is haunted. Are these live action or not? They, those are live action, and then the third live action film uh, is called Daphne and Velma. Okay, I, I'm just going to Google. It, it ignores all Scooby Doo lore, and it just has those two characters meeting. There are no other Scooby Doo characters in it. Which one would you? Which franchise is more popular? Like the Mystery Begins, or like the Curse of the Lake Monster? Or sorry, the, the Mystery Begins, or like the, this franchise? Like which one's generally the more popular one? Well, these two films were the only ones that were theatrically theatrically released. Uh, so Scooby-Doo, Curse of the Lake Monster and uh, The Mystery Begins are both set in the same continuity. So they're, they're a lot less popular because they didn't make m- money as such because they weren't released in cinemas. 
but uh i mean the mystery begins was incredibly popular you know it got i think six million uh views on cartoon network which was the highest ratings they'd ever had for a original film wow and they are they in the same universe? Sorry, i'm such an idiot here like are they in the same universe as the as the ones we just watched well they're referred to as prequels of the scooby-doo films but i mean uh you know i i don't i don't know if you've seen any of it but you know uh fred is brunette and uh velma is asian okay Okay. so you know they, 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 they don't visually uh, match up to, to their original counterparts, but they are referred to as prequels. So is this the one with Rob, Robbie Emil? This is the one with Robbie Emil, yeah. Cool, cool. No, I'm, I'm looking forward to that, mate. I'm looking forward to it. So Mystery Begins and Curse of the Lake Monster next week and Daphne and Velma, or Velma and Daphne. Yeah, da- Velma. I have not seen that film, but it looks shit. Okay, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it. So that podcast uh, should be not next episode but the episode after that right uh if, if that's what you'd like to do or or we can we can make the next episode if, if you if you're really raring to go on daphne and velma <laughs> I, don't, I honestly don't mind me honestly either way i'm happy we'll, we'll those discussions behind the scenes no worries well um yeah on behalf of calma myself um thank you guys so much for um so much for watching and thank you uh, also for con- for your continued support uh recently be sure to like subscribe comment share your thoughts down below and if you have any questions or suggestions uh email us at moviematespodcast at gmail.com and uh yeah thanks guys hope you're keeping well uh and take care bye-bye bye